two pieces of advice I think are, I, I don't agree with, and I, it is very controversial. Number one, just be yourself is utter and complete nonsense. If 80% of men are deemed unattractive by women, then just be yourself is a way for women to figure out who the losers are quicker. You need to be your most improved self in the gym every day, trying to build your business. You need to be improving yourself. Just be yourself is horrible. And the second one is you're enough. No, you're not. But I promise you, if you are working a sales job and somebody tells you you're enough, you're going to lose your job. If you want to date a super beautiful woman and then you keep believing it's okay because I'm enough, she's going to leave you. You're going to lose your job and you're going to lose your girl believing you are enough. We are valuable in this world because of the value we bring to other people. But we don't like to believe that humans are that shallow when in reality, if you just look at any preliminary evidence, it's clear that they are. You're right. The whole thing is right. I'm always trying to push the limits of what's possible, be that next version, understanding like the small details and why they matter so much, especially as it surrounds around environment, status, like the connection to all these things add up and you can transform. You can become that person quite quickly if you commit. It doesn't take long for a man to get status if, if he understands the rules to his name. All right, guys, Man on Mission, we are here again, and this time we're with an interesting guest that I sought out last minute, too. So thank you, Michael, for, for joining us last minute. But this is someone that broke the algorithm and connected into my world, I think it was a few years ago, likely. Um, and now you can see the momentum that's around. He's got a great message, an interesting message, and a sticky message. We have a lot of unique, similar friends that are high-status humans in the world of... Uh, of really bringing value to the marketplace. It's these kind of people that um, that keep the world going around. So Michael's probably one of the most connected guys, I would say, probably in Las Vegas, but about as connected as you can get. And um, what I like about Michael Sartain is he's probably one of the smartest guys out there. I got to give him a lot of credit. Sometimes he goes so deep in history, astrophysics, aliens, subjects that are really open up your mind. He blows my mind because he's, I think he's sticky in the marketplace for all the hot women that are constantly swarming around him. And, um, and really, that's what you see on the surface. But beneath the surface is one of the most intelligent people out there. But Michael Sartan, I think mostly, what do you know for man of action? Is that what it is, Michael? Yeah, I mean, um, I think probably the thing I'm most known for right now, man, it would probably be the podcast. Uh, I do a podcast on um, the main subject is evolutionary psychology, but we talk about a, a bunch of different things. Uh, intersexual dynamics. And then I have a show called Access Vegas. I do with Rolo Tomasi. Yeah. Uh, it was really ironic. Like he, I, we, we had decided to do the show before we ever met. Uh, Rolo is one of my favorite authors. And we met one time and just decided to do a panel show together. And then I have a live stream that I do where I um, interview people. I had mystery on uh, two days ago. I have different people just come on the show. Sometimes when people want to give me pitches, I, I say, hey, okay, you want to pitch me something? Got to do it in front of my my clients. Yeah. Uh, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's probably the, the main thing. And then men of action is I'm a performance coach. Uh, I have a coaching program where it's basically the lessons I learned from the military as far as leadership, the lessons I learned from building a business and the lessons I learned from, you know, 25 years in nightlife on and off. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to intersexual dynamics and women, really attractive women, uh, all the lessons, I put it into one concise course. This is basically the course I wish I could have given myself 25 years ago. Oh, I feel that. That's, this is a good one, too. So I grew up in the VIP host world as well. I was around a lot of people, had a lot of status. They dropped a lot of money. They wanted to feel important. They wanted to be special. And yeah, that whole world, it was really interesting. I think at a young age, it taught me to be, how to be savvy. I would have loved a course on this as well because those were the things that were important to me at that age. And um, yeah, there's a lot of lessons in that. I, that's probably where you broke through to me because I'm in this personal development space at this point in my life. And I see a lot of that content that breaks through where you're clearly speaking to young men yeah. trying to figure out how to be a high value person and really considering how to attract a high value woman into your world. It's a sticky topic, man. How do you attract a high value woman if you're a 21 year old and you're trying to become someone at that young age? <laughs> So the issue is there's the evolutionary features that all humans have, or like in general, almost all humans have, which is basically sort of the concepts like men are more interested in facial symmetry, hip to waist ratio, signs of youth, physical attractiveness in a woman. And then women are more interested in a man's status, his uh, ability to procure resources, his access to scarce resources, his um, social proof, things like that. And in general, we see those things and those things will be the same way a thousand years from now. They're not going to be they're not going to be weeded out. There's no selection pressure against them. So we're going to see humans act this way for a long time. Then there's the there's then there's culture and culture evolves much quicker than humans do. And right. one of the biggest cultural adaptations we've had is the Internet and more specifically dating apps and social media apps. And because of that, what's happened is there's a certain group of men that are able to display status 
at incredible scale. One of my good friends is Dan Bilzerian. He's probably the the proto example of that. For sure. Um, and so, so in his case, he's able to display status. And does his status work for every woman every time? Of course not. No. But it works for so many women so frequently that from his perspective, he's got 40 women a day coming to try to go out with him. So that when you see that kind of situation, uh, then you understand, well, if you can do this, like for instance, Consider a movie star back in the 1980s. Consider a, a Tom Cruise or whoever. His ability to just like reach out and pluck attractive women, a George Clooney. Sure. It wasn't that great. But now they just slide in your DMs. Girls get that, that DM from Champagne Poppy, Drake's IG. And the next thing you know, they're on a private jet. And like they had no intention of cheating on their boyfriend. But of course, they just fuck Drake. Yeah. You know, it just this shit happens. And like the thing is, it seems so unreasonable until, you know, you talk to enough women who've been flown out to Dubai or been at least approached about having dinner with a guy for $5,000. I'm not saying all women are, you know, are susceptible to this. But what I'm saying is enough women are susceptible to it that, What's happened is the entire market has shifted to where the men with the highest status are getting the most attention. It's true. And men who fall short of that high status level are getting little to attention, little attention. For those of you who question whether or not this is true, you should look at the statistics from dating apps. <laughs> the top 10% of men on dating apps get 63% of the right swipes. The top 20% of men get 80 3% of the right swipes. The top 40% of men on dating apps get 96% of the right swipes, which means the bottom 60% of men are, are competing for 4% four, four of women. Interesting. Okay? Wow. And by the way, you know, when you pay, I don't know if you've seen like, uh, I think Tinder stock just like cr cr uh, crumbled in the last couple of months. If you, you know, when you pay extra for the boost on those Tinder, Bumble and Hinge apps, you know what happens? Hmm. It's 93% it's men and 7% women do that. So you actually like put yourself in an even worse situation in some cases. So it's one of these things where uh, most uh, uh, on when women were surveyed, uh, women found 80% of men they encountered to be below average attractiveness. Well, of course, mathematically that doesn't work or it does, but it's very difficult to do. Um, women basically see because of social media, and this is, we're talking mainly in short-term dating context, women see fives as zeros, sixes as zeros, sevens as zeros, eights as fives, nines is sevens. And then there's only like three tens, like wow. Drake, Chris Hemsworth and fucking Aquaman. Like that's it. Everyone else is like a 9.5. So men, men are, the this, this scale is skewed so far to the left. And you should expect this from an evolutionary standpoint, because women are going to be more pecky, picky than men. There's this thing in evolutionary psychology called the parental investment hypothesis, which of the two gender, uh, two genders in a species, the one that has more parental investment is going to be the more selective of the two. You see it with certain fish, sure. male fish and male uh, seahorses, but mostly with mammals, you see the females, the ones that gestate the, um, you know, pregnancy, they're the ones who have to, uh, the, the males compete for. Sure. So, you know, that's, that's, so you should, you should expect, uh, more pickiness from women. Also 70% of divorces are initiated by women because of this pickiness. But when you, when you come to these realizations, then it's like, okay, um, you're asking, what does a man have to do yeah, to right. get a high status woman? And the answer is more. He needs to actually show more. And a lot of times it's like, I had my buddy Fit X Fearless on and he was talking about, you know, he, he like brushes his lips. Like, bro, he like, he gets the ball fade every week and he like does beard care. And he said, some of the people will get on his comments and be like, bro, you're trying too much. And I'm like, he's trying too much, but he's also fucking your girl. So like, <laughs> is he really trying too much? Yeah. It's like the guy who like wants to improve his sales team every week. He goes, he has meetings with his sales team and he's like, guys, we need to really get to the pain point. We need to keep these guys on target. And you sit there and you go through, um, you know, you go and review sales calls and you're like, this is what you could have done better. And you have a sales trainer who helps him. Is that guy doing too much or is he actually trying to build his business? And so the reality is right now with social media, I, I encourage my guys to get as many high quality photos of them in high status situations. Could be with girls, might not be with girls, could be with a nice car, might sure. not be with a nice car, but just hiking, doing cool stuff. Do as much as that of, as that as you can, because now your status is not only see, easily seen by a lot of people, because they're the ones checking you out. It seems from your standpoint to have low perceived effort. Those are Bolzarian's words in his book, The Setup. Set low up. perceived effort, okay, and infinitely scalable. And so because of that, when women are selecting the haves and the have nots, you get selected as one of the haves, and it's a huge advantage. It has never been, it, once you cross that line, 
of being one of the haves as far as dating is concerned, you have so much of an advantage compared to somebody in like 1985. Cause it wasn't like a middle level, like Eric, I, I think you and I would be considered like a uh, local celebrities or a mid tier level, lower, lower middle class of fame, right? The, this, this level of fame didn't exist in 1985. Right. You were Tom Cruise or you were a fucking janitor. That's it. There was no yep. middle class of fame. Sure. Now there's a middle class of fame because of social media. You can have a guy who lives in a city and has 200,000 followers. And like, he's got the biggest podcast in Idaho, or he's got the biggest podcast in Wichita. He's got the biggest podcast in Waco. Whenever he goes out, every, everyone knows him there. Every hot girl in the city seen his face. Sure. So it's local celebrity that you're able to produce that didn't exist before. And right now, I think in this time period, you kind of need that because when you were growing up, uh, it's Coeur d'Alene. Is that how you say the city? Coeur d'Alene, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, that, in, that instance, in that instance, what happens is a lot of girls, when they turn 18 in a smaller city in Idaho, what are they going to do? They're going to leave. They're going to go to Los Angeles. They're going to go to my, the really pretty ones are going to go to Chicago, Los Angeles, New York. They're going to go to Vegas. Vegas. You're going to go to these different places because they know they can have more opportunity to get more for their physical attractiveness. So what's happened is, uh, especially because of social media, is that guy, that, that girl who was an eight was going to marry the guy who was an eight. So he's like the personal injury attorney was going to marry like the prettiest girl at Hooters, whatever. I'm just throwing stuff sure. out there. No, it's perfect. But now she's being sucked out and she's going to the Maxim party in Los Angeles. So that guy who was going to marry the eight, Hmm. It's now got to settle for a seven, a six, a five, a four. Men normally distribute throughout the country, meaning there's a cardiologist in Coeur d'Alene who makes $300,000 a year. And there's a cardiologist in Waco who does it too. Every city's got a cardiologist. Every city's got a prime you know, defense attorney. Every city has high status males, but, but really attractive women do not normally distribute. Really attractive women heavily distribute in places where they can get more for their physical attractiveness. Brickle, South Beach, fucking um, Soho. Yeah. West Hollywood. Sure. You know, places like that. The Las Vegas Strip. This is a solid science. I got my producer over here. I told I told you it's going to be interesting, huh? Because I, I yeah. love all this shit. But, you know, it's, it, not a lot of people talk like this. And at the core of it, there's a lot of truth. I'm following every thread of what you're saying. And even if it triggers some people that don't understand, like they're not really being honest yeah. about how all this works. This is exactly how it actually works. This is what status yeah. actually is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think it's hard for people to grasp the difference between proximate or uh, descriptive and normative. So it's something when I say that's descriptive is like, for instance, male jealousy leading to murder. That's something that's very common. And uh, Dr. Buss, Dr. David Buss studies it. Mm. It's where uh, he has a book called The Murderer Next Door, which is really great. And I believe, is it Marty Hazelton? I forgot. There were two other evolutionary psychologists who wrote a book called Murder also. And so that's kind of one of the things It's like, because evolutionary psychologists uh, study murder, does that mean they condone murder? The answer is no. Sure. Just like an oncologist does not condone cancer because he studies cancer. Right. When this one of these situations, one of the things that we found through these studies is that humans are basically hairless murder apes who are incredibly shallow. No matter how much that makes you feel uncomfortable because of the Disney movies you watch or what you learned at church or what your mom and dad told you, the reality of the situation is you are here because of 200,000 years of homo sapien evolution. You're here because of 178 year, million years of mammalian evolution. That's right. why you're here. And so because of that, um, you know, that's why men compete with other men for access to scarce resources and access to women. Sure. And that's it. If women weren't picky, we'd all still be living in caves. Right. And I that's, think a, that's an ugly truth that people don't want to hear. Yeah. I think just listen to you, if you really understand, just understand this, it actually is such an advantage to know how it all works. Be really aware of it. That's why someone should come near you. Study. Huge advantage. This is a huge, just understanding the, 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 the biology, the yeah. history, and really the formula. To me, this is a set of rules. And if you know the rules to play, you can advance to the next level. So many people are trying to win in life, but they're not playing by the same set of rules that me and you were playing by. Hard to break through yeah. the algorithm if you're never gonna if you're never gonna try to understand these rules. So first you gotta understand them, and then you gotta figure out how to create demand in your life. Bottom line, end of story. But it's funny. So I work with a lot of women too. Probably more women I work with, which is weird. It just is what it is. I work with probably more women um, than I do with men in the coaching space. So I lot of work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and I this is me stepping out trying to find big stages in life. I'm kind of falling in my mentor, Ed Milet's footsteps right now. So I'm doing all the things and it's, and I'm, I'm getting all the scar tissue. I'm learning all the lessons. I'm giving value to the world. I'm stepping in the light. But what I find as I do this work, especially with women, so many women are coming and say, how do I find a you? I hear it all the time. Eric, can you help me find a guy? Can you help like, I just, it's, it's like a panic in women, especially women that have maybe yeah. been divorced. They're at, they're at 40 years old. They feel like the clock is ticking. It is a pressure cooker. And now I'm trying to teach people to have standards, like all the things, but it's like, well, 
<laughs> you know, this is tricky. There's actually not a lot of high value people that exist in the world. You're right. It's a tiny class of people that actually have yes. real demand. Yeah. And, and the thing with women, um, it's really great. Um, I have found that I, I love having women in my program, but yep. selling advice to women doesn't seem to be quite the same business model as selling it to men. Totally. Um, because I feel like a lot of women's advice stuff is people like taking advantage of women by telling them what they feel like. For instance, uh, the five love languages. Great There's point. no science behind that. That's absolutely no science behind the five love languages. Interesting. Uh, when people okay. believe in the secret or stuff. like Yeah. It's like there's no science behind any of this. Uh, Joe Dispenza, that kind of stuff. There's no science behind it. When you when you get into that kind of stuff, then what happens is what you have women is like you'll you'll sit there and you'll evoke emotion in them instead of giving them what's really great feedback. Sure. Here's a great piece of feedback. For instance, this concept that, hey, a man didn't call you back because he was intimidated by you. Ladies, if you care about your friends, stop giving them this fucking terrible advice. No man was intimidated by you. That's not why he didn't call you back. Just like I, per I don't like pickles. That's a preference mm -hmm. I have. And often you hear women say, I don't want to date a man who's shorter than me. Mm -hmm. That's a preference you have. If I'm dealing with a woman who works 60 hours a week or 80 hours a week, makes a whole lot of money and doesn't have time for me. I didn't break up with her because I was intimidated by her. It was a preference that I had. When you tell me, when you tell women, well, he was intimidated by you, then what you're doing is saying, you don't need to do anything to improve yourself or a relationship. It's right. all his fault. And when you do so, you create a cycle where the woman can continually gets disappointed in relationship after another. If the, the, when men give other men advice, the first thing we tell each other is no one's going to save you and you're accountable for your own solutions. 100%. If, if you're getting advice from women about women and it does not include those two things, stop listening. Good point. Stop listening. I like you that. You need to be lit. The advice you understand is if you are consistent, if you complain to your therapist that the last five guys you dated were narcissists, it's not their fault. After five, it's not their fault anymore. It's your fault. Yeah. There's something inside of you where your antenna is is cross-wired or you're not quite calibrated or you're way too sensitive to certain stimuli and you need to do something to fix it. And I've always, a, a piece of advice, this uh, another two pieces of advice I think are, I, I don't agree with and I, it is very controversial. Number one, just be yourself is utter and complete nonsense. If 80% of men are deemed unattractive by women, then just be yourself is a way for women to figure out who the losers are quicker. You need to be your most improved self mm. in the gym every day, trying Love to build it. your business, trying to read 40 to 60 books a year. You need to be improving yourself. Just be yourself is horrible. And the second one is you're enough. No, you're not. You're not. You can believe you're enough if that makes you feel better because you're suffering from PTSD. But I promise you, if you're working a sales job and somebody tells you you're enough, you're going to lose your job. And if you keep believing, if you want to date a super beautiful woman and then you keep believing it's okay because I'm enough, she's going to leave you. Yeah. You're going to lose your job and you're going to lose your girl believing you are enough. No, we are valuable in this world because of the value we bring to other people. Totally. We realize it's not all about us. It's what value can I bring to others? And when I bring value to other people, then all the riches and status and all the networking and all the cool friends and all the cool travel places, they come to you. Mm. But we don't like to believe that humans are that shallow when in reality, if you just look at any preliminary evidence, it's clear that they are. Yeah, it's really good. You know, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm considering a lot of the instincts, even in my own self, just trying to reflect on my own existence. I'm 40 years old now, so I'm looking back on my life. Shit, I wish I would have had this mindset at 21. I'd be so deadly. But at 40 years old, like I'm thriving as good as it gets. So it's really easy for me to frame some of the instincts I had as a kid growing up, the, the things that were my experiences that turned me into my reality. And, um, and you're right. The whole thing is right. I was always trying to push the limits of what's possible, be that next version, understanding like the small details and why they matter so much, especially as it surrounds around environment status, like the connection to all these things add up. And you can transform. I think the the big point is that you you're probably beneath the surface saying is that you can become that person quite quickly yeah. if you commit. <laughs> it doesn't take long for yeah. a man to get status if if he understands the rules to this game, right? Yeah. So so for men and women, gaining status as far as networking, business leadership is right. concerned, yep. these are definitely things that you can learn. Sure. And men, for men, we have a rite of passage. Almost all men have to go through it, whether or not you play on a football team, you join the military, or you're like the junior associate at a law firm. You always have to go some sort of rite of fat passage. Sure. Some women do too. I had two uh, female squadron commanders while I was in the Air Force. They had to go through a rite of passage as well. So that's the case. But when it comes to attractiveness, men have to go through a rite of passage. Women, not so much. Women can 
play the game on easy mode. If you are a 19 year old girl and you're very attractive, there's no rite of passage you have to go through. You don't need dating advice to, totally. to become more attractive and you don't need experience with men to get more men to want to date you. <laughs> you're just attractive. As a man though, we have to become a thing that other women find attractive. Sure. And that takes a lot of work. Yeah. Being broke and good looking as a man gets you nothing. Being broke and hot as a, as a <laughs> female gets you everything. Like, yeah. like it's a gateway in, into a mansion. <laughs> If you're a female, Eric, Eric let, let's, 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 let's take this to a, an even darker place. Okay. I mean, how about the concept of this? If you're a man and you have autism, your likelihood likely, and you're just a normal dude in a vacuum, uh, you're not super true. rich or good Sad. looking. If you're a man and you have autism and you try to approach women, you're going to have a really hard time. Totally. If you're an attractive woman with autism, men don't care. <laughs> they don't not, they don't care. It's a dark Guys, place. And I'm not, I'm not trying to equate no, you get it, Amber Heard's autism, but yeah. like, I just, I just want you to consider yeah. ready. I know your audience probably didn't, weren't ready to hear this today, no, but good. I want you to consider how smart Elon Musk is, right? How much money this guy's worth, the incredible frontier that he's put humanity on. This man is going to be remembered for thousands of years. Sure. And he put his dick in Amber Heard. <laughs> Always remember that. <laughs> Just no matter how smart you think people are, he put his penis in a woman who uh, shit on a dude's bed. Yeah. You just never forget that. So when you realize that, it's like you are like you, you're asking before, Eric, it's like, well, you know, these women are saying, hey, I need to find a good guy. A lot of times our emotions drive us into the wrong place. And people, a third party, like a great example would be you giving them advice as a third party. So a lot of times you're going to give better advice to a woman. Why? Because the dude she's talking about doesn't turn you on. Good he point. has no effect over you. It's a great point. You can see this thing dispassionately. Sure. Right. But as a lot of times as men and women can get it. turned on like a blowtorch yeah. and then we, be, we start becoming extremely reactive. Women act delusional and think that men, because they slept with a 10, that they can get a nine to commit and men act delusional because they watch some pornography and think women act that way. Yeah. And so both sides get delusional because of that. And that's essentially what hundred percent. I wonder as society goes on, where does this end? Is this going to get worse? And, and is it getting worse in real time quickly and compounding fast? It seems like the role of a male and female is getting very confused children or I don't know what the yeah. future of children is, but it seems like there's a powerful force trying to fuck with their minds. Am I wrong? I think from our standpoint, if we look at uh, the lens of modernity, we're going to say it's going to get worse. Mm. But I think a hundred years from now, you're going to look back and be like, oh, this is just the way things were going to get. <laughs> I can give you a couple examples. Um, Wow. There's going to probably be a point, uh, Ray Kurzweil talks about this in his book, where women are able to have babies with other women. They're able to take 23 alleles from two women and put them together and have another child. Wow. When that happens, they're not going to need men. And there's also going to be a point, most likely, where we have androids that are so similar to humans that men will start to date them. And at that point, men won't need women. So is that better or worse? Well, hmm, it seems like it's worse, right? Uh, you know, it's probably gonna have a population collapse if you see something like that happen. Also, you know, when you come with the concept is like, are things better or worse? When you're dealing sure. with a species, remember there's 400,000 elephants left on the planet and it's 8 billion humans. What's better or worse when there's 8 billion of you? Like you, we, we won. Like on the, the, on the game of planet Earth, yeah. we beat everyone. We point. became the apex predator and we filled every habitable portion of the globe with our stink and filth and poop. We, we, we did that. And so you ask yourself, what's better or worse? There's no selection pressure. If humans live and they're happier, whatever, like I've always said this before, the day that artificial intelligence takes over, like truly takes over society will be the happiest day of your life because you're going to be in a hollow deck somewhere living out your dreams with your fantasy family and your fantasy wife on your, in your fantasy vacation when living so incredibly sedated and incredibly calm and relaxed and happy. And that day while you're doing that, AI has taken over the entire world mm. and you won't even care. Like that's, that's the future. Honestly, I know it sounds very negative and dystopian, but that's the future I see. And so what I'm saying is on the way to that, is that good or bad? I mean, it's sure. up to you, what you so, think, you know, you, on you, the way to that, why, picture, why not bro. use those tools to your advantage? Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, it, it, you can't control it all. You might as well leverage what you can to try to create fulfillment. That means something for you. <laughs> And again, like a lot of people, are, you know, it's man, I've heard so many crazy statistics about the sort of the masses, especially in America, two thirds of yeah. Americans couldn't come up with a thousand dollars to if their crazy. life depended on it. it blows my mind. Like so, it, so, 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 uh, you know, Ed Milet's team, uh, for the annuities, they got, uh, Marshall Falk is one of his, uh, uh, he's, he's on the team now yep. and Marshall and I got it. We we're just on a call, uh, an hour ago. Amazing. And, uh, we were talking about this exact thing about how two thirds of people couldn't pull. Oh, you, know, you were. Pull yeah. Up $1, yeah. A lot of, a uh -huh. lot of stats that will speak right to this. And, it, and it's super, 
it's a trip to me because I'm not around these people and I try to stay grounded to pain. I really do. I try to stay so grounded to this stuff and I do it through children, through charity. Um, I love charity. I've, I've always said yes to philanthropy and I try to stay remembering about kids with cancer. I'm on the board for make a wish. So these things are important to me, right? But I forget because I only swarm around people that want more out of life, that are hungry, that are entrepreneurial, that are a lot of rich people. And I forget the masses and how they operate, what their reality is, even though I came from it. Again, it's so easy to forget when you're on, when you're a high value human and you're constantly pushing limits as possible. I'm only around interesting people all the time because my time's so limited. I, I capitalize it by put, be putting myself in places I want to be. And it, you forget what these people are going through and what it's actually like down there. But at the end of the day, the trajectory of where we're at and where we've been and where we're going, you're probably right. If you just think about trajectory alone, this, I don't know if this ends well, like you're probably right. This is not going to be a well, pretty sight. There's a great book on this. Um, it's called, uh, the, um, enlightenment now by Steven Pinker. I heard of that. Yeah. And, and the way it works is like, overall, the human existence has become easier. It has. Even if you're poor, sure. if you're a poor person today, you have access to antibiotics that the King of England did not have in the 17th century. Yeah, cell phones. So, like, Nikes. whatever what we what we deem as poor today, like if you guys have seen those tents that are up in Santa Monica, California, those people are not living hor- like compared to people in Managua, they're, they're not living that horribly. The uh, the overall human experience has gotten easier, maybe not better, but it's gotten easier. Hmm. But the difference between the wealthiest and the and the poorest has gotten even greater. Even though the bottom, all ships, you know, uh, a rising tide sure. raises all ships. All ships, yeah. In general, like you and I are two of the richest humans that have ever existed on the face of the planet. If you consider sure. the 110 billion humans that came before us, Great point. we're, we're of, of, as far as wealth is concerned, like I don't have any food scarcity. I live in a building like, like the still, like you can live a, a middle-class existence and compared to your ancestors, your exceptional wealthy, wealthy. as can be. Yeah. So there's, there's two ways to look at it. Number one, the overall human experience I think is going to get better right? In general, sure. because we're going to have holodecks and faster high-speed internet and artificial intelligence is going to solve a lot of our problems. But what's going to happen is those at the top are going to have even disproportionately more. And then we get into really scary topics when it comes to like, for instance, augmentations of the brain, putting mm. a computer chip in there instead of an amygdala, and then being able to access the internet in your brain. You're going to have a, a group of people that are, are that are augmented and they have massive advantages when it comes to productivity and work. And then a group of people that are like, no, I'm never going to do this. I'm never putting any of these chips in my body and they're going to have a massive disadvantage. I think mm. that's something you can expect to see in the future. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Remember, there's a difference between descriptive and normative. But to describe, that is most definitely something that you expect to see. You see Elon Musk trying to push the Neuralink stuff. Uh, the thing is, if you don't want to get Neuralink, and I don't, I don't blame most people who wouldn't want to get it. The problem is what happens is in 50 years when the people who you compete with, um, you graduated from Harvard, but you're competing with a guy who's a cyborg, he's going to beat you. Yeah. And that's, that's essentially what's going to happen. That's something you can look forward to. Bro, I could talk to you all day. Easy. Like, <laughs> like for a thousand hours of just intri- intriguing conversation. I go toe to toe with you. This is really cool. It's so hard. Cause I want, I could take this conversation. We could keep going that direction. I'm like thinking, what's the best form of government? There's till, so many questions I, I have for you. I got till 615. All right, I got till brother. 615. We can go another hour and Oh man, I, I I won't max you out all the way, brother. But my point is, is, is there's so many levels to you of depth that intriguingly sp- spark the brain. Anyone's listening is I guarantee if, if anyone with intelligence is they're, they're lighting on fire now. And even if you've sparked a, a trigger them, it's a great debate, a great conversation about just humanity in general, what works, what doesn't, why it does. But you're right. All this speaks to an evolutionary reality where we, the ground we've covered. And we're now going into this unique unseen territory. It's funny. I just got back from Dubai and every time I go to these unique places bro I just look down at like what humans are capable of doing I mean Dubai makes Vegas look like a little crack town it just blows my mind it's it's, it's so crazy Uh, I was just talking to somebody about this we were talking about evolutionary theory and then mm -hmm. what's the point of studying it It was me ho math there's a biologist her name was Corey and then destiny we were having a debate on uh, PWF's channel on Sunday oh wow cool and 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 while we were doing that one of the questions was, was like, why do we study this? Like, wouldn't it be better to just go out there and get information from dating? And my whole thing was, you know, gravity is still a theory. It is. We've never actually experienced a graviton. We've never measured one. And I know the flat earthers are like, like literally getting an erection listening to me say this, <laughs> but like we, gravity is still a theory. It, right. it is. Even though we know it to be true, we've never actually married, uh, measured a graviton. We can judge by dropping different objects that they drop at about 9.81 meters per second squared. And so since we know that eventually someone has to build a Burj Khalifa, 
So even though it's a theory, did mm. they still build the building? Sure. What, but they, when you build the Burj Khalifa, you did so incorporating gravity in the engineering. Am I wrong? Right. Do you not use uh, Newtonian physics 100%. whenever you build something like that? Of course you do, right? So in order to do that, when you come to that realization, at some point you have to take these things that you're studying and you, someone has to take action. Just like in evolutionary studies, eventually you wanna go out and meet the girl. And just like when it comes to physics, eventually you wanna put a, a ship in space and eventually you wanna build a 2,700 foot skyscraper. Sure. So at some point, somebody has to take some fucking action and stop second guessing themselves and always questioning ideas. Eventually, somebody has to take action. Yeah. Those are the bold ones. Again, the questions about whether or not you could build an electric car at scale to where it was actually affordable for the public to buy, that was a question they, that somebody had. And Elon Musk said, mm, I understand the science. He studied material physics in college. He's like, I understand. I understand the science. Um, if that's the case, we're just going to go for it with it, no matter what anyone thinks. And that's those people who are bold like that. Those are the ones who become outrageously wealthy because you solve a problem. People that didn't even know they had, you know, those are the people who become outrageously wealthy. Nobody yeah. know that knew they needed an iPhone until Steve Jobs showed it to us. And nobody knew they needed a Tesla until Elon Musk showed it to us. Yeah, that's so true. And in, in, in Dubai too, what another thing I'm just, since we're on this topic, interesting there, there doesn't seem to be any poverty at all. No one's on the street, not a lot of crime going on. I'm just looking at a free market and what a system of, of government is that may work the best. Mm. It almost seems like the free market is a better decider of what works and what doesn't, what's good, what's not. It weeds out the bad better than any government on earth could let the free market rip. Is that what going on in Dubai? Well, so the, the difference with Dubai is that Dubai has, it's very similar. So, you know, going to in-state tuition in the state of Texas is inexpensive. And the reason why is because the University of Texas school system owns hundreds of like millions of acres of oil land. Right. Uh, they get they get subsidies from oil, which is the reason why you can right. go to UT Austin sure. if you live in Texas really inexpensively. The same thing goes on in Dubai because the United Arab Emirates has the uh, Emirati Shipping Company. I believe that's the name of the, the company. Uh, they they produce so much in revenue that they actually function, the entire federal government there functions off revenues from the shipping companies. Um, and so there is no federal taxation right, in Dubai. I believe that's the case. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And so that that's the reason why. So in a <laughs> microcosm, if you have a society that where the government actually is a net positive as far as revenue is sure. concerned, I think you can do exactly what they did in Dubai. It's point. harder when you have the South side of Chicago and you have the East side of St. Louis totally. and South Dallas. It's harder when you have fucking Liberty city in, in right. Miami or Compton, California, those places, it becomes a little bit more difficult for you to continue to do that because some of those places are not net positive as far as the government is concerned. So I think on a small scale, absolutely what you do in Panama, what you do in, uh, Dubai, what you do in Luxembourg, what you do in Liechtenstein, what you do in um, uh, uh, Monaco. I think those things work in a smaller scale, but I think once you get to a larger scale, it's it's kind of difficult to to pull something like that off. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Every time I do these podcasts, I interview these incredible people. We've interviewed so many interesting people, good people, people doing shit in the marketplace, amazing things. It is so clear as I as I see what value actually looks like. You teach this. You teach how to be a high value man. It it just in how you communicate, how you articulate, how you chop things up, how you present information. It is so easy to see where value comes from. And it's just cool to think about you're out there teaching guys how to be high value. Like what a game that is. How fun. That's just a fun, fun game to play because it'd be fun to see yeah. a guy turn him into a stallion, into a, someone that can articulate the way you do, can communicate the way you do, has got some insight, has a little swagger. But a lot of guys, I mean, I don't, do, can they pull this off? I mean, I keep going back to this because I think it's just so interesting. I didn't want to divert too far, but can you teach someone to do what you do, brother? Is that a real thing that can be done? Or is this, are you born yeah, like I this? No, absolutely. I mean, that's, I wouldn't have a program if you couldn't teach it. So right. the results that I get on my social media, that I show on my social media, I replicate it with hundreds of my clients. And then show people whenever, if you were considering joining men of action, I'll show you, uh, oh, you think, oh, this won't work for me because I'm the short Indian man or yeah. I'm the overweight, older grandfather. This won't work for me because I'm recently divorced and haven't been on a date in 20 years. <laughs> right. So I'll show you 10 guys in the program who are recently divorced, the, the short Indian or Asian guy, the African-American guy who only wants to date white women, whatever trope whatever. you want to make up. Yep. We have, we have, we have dozens, if not hundreds of testimonials for each one of those tropes, destroying your limiting beliefs. So I think, yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't even, I would have never taught this if I didn't think it was completely replicatable. 
Um, and yeah, uh, going back to what you said before, like turning them into stallions, that is fun. But remember, and you know, this as a coach is that you also have to take on their burdens. So it's not always fun. Sure, sure, sometimes when you have clients that are, you know, considering taking their own life, uh, when you All have clients that, that are like heavy. Had serious financial troubles or one of the worst is clients who've had their children taken away and they can't see their kids anymore. You have to take that on as well as a coach, yeah. which is why a lot more people are trying to be coaches than need to be coaches. Totally. And so, so like, that's one of the things you have to take on is like my clients well being is, is my responsibility. Now I have over 850 clients now, so it makes it a little bit more difficult, but because they're, they're, well-being is my responsibility. That means when things go bad, I have to take responsibility for that too. And so it's, it's not always fun. Yeah. It's not always fun. You have to do, you have to do this because you love this. You can't do this because you want to buy some Facebook ads and tell your friends you're a fucking life coach. Yeah. And there's so many people doing that. It is crazy to me. It's like, bro, like you're a life coach, but I don't want your life. You know, it's, yeah. it, I see that so frequently. So, I mean, it's just an interesting thing to, to, uh, to, to concern yourself with. Totally. To, to, study. Well, all these guys, they come to you in different places. You got to try to try to figure out how to at scale, meet someone where they're at and they may be in different places, but universally, yeah. what is one of these one things that you see? Is it easy transformation that the average person, whoever, whatever average is to you that shows up can instantly start turning around and applying in real time to maybe starting to get some momentum in their life or, 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 you know, have some wins yeah. coming up. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to be very, there's one thing I really don't like to do is be vague. I really can't stand when people Love give it. advice that's super vague. And, and again, it's good. these are some of the greatest speakers ever. Uh, Tony Robbins is guilty of this, but I still love Tony Robbins, but he gives this vague advice. I'm going to give you specific advice. I love Ready? Here's one thing. Give I need it. all of you guys to get used to watching yourself on camera. Hmm. I need you to get on zoom calls, maybe with your friends, do some kind of Toastmasters. It is so incredibly valuable in today's age because so much business is done over zoom totally. for you to watch yourself on camera, to have a setup with good lighting and good audio so that you can communicate with other people. It might be a girl you're going to go on a date with. It might be a video that you make for social media. It might be several other things, but watching yourself on camera to become a better communicator, to see if you have weird tics or weird head movement that you weren't aware of. It's so incredible to hear what your voice sounds like. Do you mumble? Is there pauses in between the words? I cannot express to you how important this is. It seems it's like, uh, if you ever watch uh, Suits, no, yeah, way. I love uh, that show. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. You remember Suits? Yeah. You remember the, the, the thing where Harvey's talking to Michael and he goes, you see that guy over there? He's never going to make senior associate because he doesn't get it. Yeah, right. He doesn't get it. Yeah. Part of getting it is you watch yourself on camera. Do you emote properly or do you come off weird? Like that's <laughs> something you need to see. Second, the number one thing that you can do that's scalable to show value with low perceived effort and it's completely free is social media. Is the problem with social, the, the good thing about social media is it's incredibly scalable. The bad thing about social media is that when you get on social media, it brings you to the lowest form of thinking, sure. but you have to, in order to stay relevant, all of us have to have to make our social media better. So what I, I recommend for you guys is become social media producers, not social media consumers. I agree. Become social media producers and not social media consumers. So use social media either to level up your networking, sure. your dating life, your leadership skills, or your business. I, uh, that would be the second thing I would recommend. And then the third thing I would recommend to everybody, uh, this is a huge change, is anytime you're in your car, anytime you're eating food, or anytime you're in the gym, you need to be listening to audiobooks. It's time to throw the music away. It needs to be audiobooks or yep. podcasts that are getting you closer to your goal. And you need to learn how to watch, listen to them at 1.5 speed, 1.7 speed, 2.0 speed, so you can get through them faster and take notes um, and educate yourself. I, like, guys, seriously, there's no reason. I don't care if you're an entrepreneur or whatever, you still eat food, you still drive your car, okay? And you still go to the gym. In those moments, if you're listening to audiobooks, you can get anywhere between 25 and 60 books a year, Game depending changer. on how fast you listen. Yeah. And so that's what I would recommend you do. You guys, but the thing is you got to give up the music and yeah. in order to do that, that's what you need to be listening to. And it's, uh, those are three things. And probably the fourth one is like, find a mentor who's doing better than you and uh, speed of implementation and suspension of disbelief. Yep. You just do what they say. Like uh, no matter how much qu uh, questioning you have, like, again, like Ty Lopez is a buddy of mine. Do I want everything Ty Lopez has? No, like we, we have some differences, but there's so many things you can learn from Ty sure. from him spending all that money on those YouTube ads and then selling a pro a program that he made a hundred million dollars off right. uh, from 67 steps. If you don't feel like you can learn anything <laughs> from that or the way Wes Watson built a brand after getting out of prison and he does $4 million a month or the way Cole Gordon went from being a bartender to now he's doing three, 4 million a month doing sales training or the way Jeremy Miner went from like being an LDS door to door uh, evangelist to now he's one of the biggest sales trainers in the country. Sure. When you find out that, uh, you know, Ryan Stuman being a convicted felon for drug charges, and now he's, he's got, you know, incredible business and the, the apex mastermind group or Dan Fleischman who went from selling 
t-shirts and energy drinks. And now the dude is worth, you know, probably a couple hundred million dollars from some setting up these amazing events, these Aspire events that he's doing. Why not learn from them? Yeah. Why not learn from them, bro? Do you understand? It's so crazy. Like I go to dinner with Dan Fleischman and I should be paying because of all the information he gives me. And the dude will never let me pay. Like yeah. those are the friends you want, dude. Yeah. Those are the friends you want. Yeah. I just like having conversations with, with Dan Fleischman. I make millions of dollars. Yeah. And Bulzarian is another one too. The guy's a genius. Yeah. Like so many people want to hate on him because they're like, no, you inherited all the money. I've seen the wire transfers. I will swear in front of a, a, uh, on a stack of Bibles, I've seen the wire transfers and I've seen the text messages between he and Alec Gores. He's won $54 million in one year playing poker. Yeah. That did happen. Regardless of whether or not you think he inherited money, he sure. won $50 million playing poker. So, you know, there's one of these things is like, well, if he did that and he didn't inherit all the money, then fuck, that could have been me. Fuck, I could have done that. And then you start, you start hating on him because of it. Sure. So that's one of the things um, that I've seen that's happened before. There's always good things that you can learn from people, but you don't have to take all of their proclivities. Uh, you, like just for instance, if you, if you ever met guy, uh, Eric, you remember when you're probably working as a VIP host, some guy who's like incredible with women, just crushing him with the ladies, but he's always got a little blow on him. Maybe he's like, he cheats on his wife. Like you want to take the good with women part, but Absolutely. you don't want the cheating on the wife and the fucking oh, cocaine part. You don't want weirdo. that part. Yeah. Yeah. You take the good parts, but you leave the bad parts. Of course. But you do that with multiple mentors and you never make excuses and you yeah. never hate on them. You do that. That's a key to success. I totally agree. You know, Ed called me last week at like five in the morning and, um, and he's like, brother, you okay? I'm just checking. I'm a good dude. Right. And uh, we ended up talking for a while and, um, he was on a, a podcast that he had with Jamie Kern Lima and he was like, Hey, your name got brought up. He was just loving on me. This is what good mentors do also is they, is they really care about their people. But, um, he says, we were talking about who the next, the next speakers that are coming up in the game are, you know, I'm getting tired. I'm getting old. And, uh, we think it's you, man. We were talking about you. So it was great validation, but he says, you know why, you know why I like you so much. You know why you really, really sat with me. You're the most coachable guy I've ever had in all the years. You're the most coachable mm. guy I've ever had. There's a lot of validation in that, in that being coachable. That is such a gift. And you know, when people aren't coachable, they literally think they know it all. They don't listen. They, do, they never make investments in themselves. They look at them as expenses yeah. that they can't afford. I'm like, no motherfucker, this is an investment that you can't not afford. Uh, Dude, man, I, I had Jeremy Miner on, uh, to last week and he goes do you know the hardest people to coach are the ones that make low six figures from their sales team yeah. it's like they think they know everything i was like dude i make five hundred thousand a month and this guy's telling me because he makes one hundred and twelve thousand dollars a year yeah. that i don't know shit it's like it's the hard it's really funny because i you know i i host all the bikini competitions here in las vegas and i host a bunch of beauty pageants and it's really funny the girls at the top who are probably going to win they never ask for anything they always yeah, show up right. on time they're incredible to Class work with acts. and the, these mid these mid tier girls with 2k followers Pain are asking ass. you to fly them out they're, <laughs> they show up late they complain yeah. about everything and i'm That's like funny. are you kidding you um, don't even look like your photos That's like what are you doing <laughs> so you see you see this happen all the time yeah. man and it's just it's just one of these things is like when you're at the top it's just so much easier like being when you're, when you're at dinner with super high status people who are very functional, no one's hating on each other. No. You're just passing around great like knowledge to make a bunch of money. There's no way. You're right. Like, I love Wes and I love uh, Brad Lee. And I love Ryan Pineda. And I love Ryan Stuman. I love Dan Fleischman. I love all these guys. And if you told me next week that one of these guys made a billion dollars, I would feel nothing but happiness I, for them. Absolutely. Not the slightest hint of jealousy. I feel I'd that. feel nothing but happiness for them. I'd ask them to come on my podcast and be like, hey, would you be willing to share what you did to, to, to make that work? If uh, Mike Rashid or uh, Brandon Carter or Greg O'Gallagher or any of these guys, I'll, I'll, nothing but happiness for them. Sure. And that's the attitude you got to have. And I, so I, I'm trying to be the guy that I want to network with. Absolutely. I want to be never hate on my friends behind their back, always trying to learn from them, always try to provide value, always trying to connect them with other people. Yeah. And that's what I try to teach my clients to be. You need to be the person in your life, in your circle that everyone meets their girlfriend through, that everyone gets their job through, that everyone gets their employee, like, um, yeah. finds their employees through, sure. finds their sponsors through, finds figure. You should be the one everyone's asking which books to read, which restaurants to go to. You should be the center of that hub. Yeah. That's what I teach people. And in doing so, you gain in status. Yeah, absolutely, man. You're, you're, you're nailing all these things like dead on. Just being a person of value that bleeds that value. You never ask for anything. You don't need to, man, because opportunities always come around you. I mean, that's just what being yeah. about. This is what, I mean, I always talk about being the money. I am the money. I am what I preach. I live and die this way. Yeah. Like I just, and I die for my standards. Like you can't fuck with me. 
It's this unfuckable with energy that I've learned to curate, especially at 40. It's, it's dangerous now. So I was on stage last week in Mexico and I had this moment of clarity that never happened to me before. It washed over me fast. And I know you'll speak probably, you'll write a book to this topic. I'm sure you will because you're so educated and you've done, you just understand things. But it was this moment when I was about to speak and I paused. And when I'm on stage, cause I'm nervous, there's adrenaline. The pauses feel like minutes sometimes. And it was a little uncomfortable. I just sat in and, and literally a pen drop. Something was happening to me. And I felt this pen drop in this earth. Mm -hmm. Like it was like a earth, like wave came crashing through the energy into my heart, that pen. It, it's like I could feel it. And what I realized yeah. in this moment, all these eyeballs teaming at me, they're like holding their breath. And you know what came to my mind? It was right there. It all made sense. What an unfair fucking advantage this is for me. I just yeah. have such an unfair advantage right now over yeah. all you people. And it, it was this moment of honesty. I actually told them that. And then I opened up. But I started thinking about the Warren Buffetts, the Steve Jobs, the Walt Disney's of the world. And I realized these people have been in the light their entire lives. They built an entire empire around standing in the light in front of the barbarians, like yeah. giving their soul to the world. And that's what they just did for the rest of their lives. You yeah. know what I mean? We've tapped into it a little yep. bit, but it's now yeah. getting clear of what an actual unfair advantage it really is. You, you have to consider like one of the biggest fears that people have in general is public speaking. Sure. And you know, when you consider like uh, your ancestors, they would live in small tribes, maybe right. 115 to 150 people. Right. In those small tribes, if you were judged to be unfit, there was nowhere you. for you to turn. Right. If you were a woman, you had sex with the wrong man, sure. then you were going to be ostracized from the tribe. Yep. And if you're a, 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 bo a young boy and you're looking for a girl to pair up with and all of them think you're a weirdo, you just die a virgin. That's it. Yeah. Like that's the, the existence. So people inherently cared a lot more about what others thought about them. So getting in front of a large group of people, there's this an inherent fear that happens. Eventually you get to the point where I'm sure you're at this point. I'm sure Ed's at this point where you transmute that into like nothing but energy and excitement and sure. gratitude. And the fact that I feel that I can still feel that nervous after giving all these speeches, I think that's really awesome. The other thing you talked about before about Ed, Ed saying that you're very coachable. One of my favorite books is The Dichotomy of Leadership by Jocko Willick and Leif yeah. Babin. Yeah. And one of the things he talks about is leadership and followership. So probably because you're such a good, uh, because you're so coachable, later on when you have a, like a, say a high ticket uh, uh, program and you, you're sitting there trying to coach your sales team or whatever. The first thing I do, I have a Thursday sales meeting. By the way, I'm, 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 uh, hopefully none of my sales guys are watching this. I'm bringing Dan Bilzerian on the call to like, to surprise ah, my sales. Cool, team. man. What a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, yeah, can I be on that call? He's coming on. Huh? <laughs> I said, fuck, can I yeah. be on that call? Yeah, for sure. Eric, I'll give you a link. You can jump oh, on the call. Awesome, man. So, so, so one of the things, the first thing I asked my sales team, do you know what it is? Every Thursday I said, guys, what did I do this week that created an objection for you that I can fix? That's mm. always the first thing I ask. And I'm their boss. The first thing I ask is, what can I do to make your job easier? I'm still at the point now, and it's getting harder to do this. Anytime we have a new salesperson who's struggling on a call, if they want my assistance, I stop whatever I'm doing and jump on a call with them, or I'll make a Loom video for them. Because my, my main job as the CEO of my company is to serve. That's my main job. It is to serve. I agree. If you grasp that concept and understand I'm only value. Yes, I have equity in the company. Sure, they can't fire me, whatever, right? One of my, you, you know why my podcast is called the Michael Sartain Podcast? Mm. Because do you remember what Ty Lopez's uh, website was called when he sold 67 steps? Do you mm. remember? No, I don't. Ty it Lopez? was .com. Yeah. Okay. Do you know the only person you can't fire from TyLopez.com? Ty Lopez. Ty Lopez. Yeah, right. And so that's why that's why I kept it. Because I, I watched the Call Her Daddy thing, you know, when they both split up. Oh, yeah. The number one podcast sure. in the world, and then they split up. I was like, I never want that to happen to me. So that's why that's why it's called the Michael Sartain podcast. Smart. But um, that, so so from that from that whole standpoint, you know, you just learn um, it, it, because of your coachability and because of the fact that you're willing to serve other people, you're just a better leader. Yeah. Most of the time, right. leadership is responsibility. And there is a little bit of authority. Obviously, you're going to need some authority. But if it's all authority and you're not serving your team, then you're eventually people. The only reason anyone's going to work for you is money. And money, while it is a really strong motivator, it does wear out over time. Sure. You know? It's really, it's really hard to keep people motivated. If they have a, if you pay them really well, they got a couple million in the bank. It's really hard to keep them motivated. So what you want is more intrinsic value. That's why like with our sales team, we're, we're trying out sales pods where we have the sales team compete with each other and the winner gets a free whatever. Sure. You know, we're trying to do different things like that. So you want, you need to find some sort of intrinsic motivation for people other than money. 
Uh, yeah. And then, you know, that's that's a really good thing to do. But also serving your team, I think, is probably the most important. Yeah. For a decade, I built retail business and and our whole thing about building culture with these young entry level kids, a lot of more young bucks moving furniture around. I mean, furniture and retail and jewelry retail or our retail stores. But so much of it was about building culture. And the way I tapped into it was I taught these young guys how to create their own businesses within the business. So they have all these customers. We're in some of the wealthiest homes in America in our furniture store business. We sell to very, very high net worth people. We're in some of the most posh neighborhoods out there. We got a really unique business model. And you got these young kids showing up and I really engaged in their mind. It didn't take a lot of effort, but it's interesting to see they don't leave you that long. Actually, the turnover is way less when you create culture around teaching them how to make money. The fear was, are they going to leave me? But really, it's like, no, they end up fucking idolizing you. They love you. They always give you credit. They stay around much longer. And yeah, they feed off your customers. Now they show up to your customers. They love them. They smell good. They shake their hand. They look them in the eye. It's not hard to give value to people, to teach people how to win and build culture around just that intrinsic value that that is yeah. it really born it easy. Like, what a great yeah. way to lead, too. But they stay around much longer. Like and that's the thing is you can fit inside my dreams. Now, let me show you what we could do together. Most leaders I, f- I found, they actually serve themselves. They're a little jaded. They're uh, a little, you know what I mean? They're so, uh, they're trying to grip something that they're, they're losing sight of the reality of what it looks like to be a real leader, a real CEO. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really important to understand that concept of, um, of like trying to serve your team yeah, uh, and, 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 and being, being, it, it could do. That's how successful businesses are run. I'm making their jobs easier. Yeah, you know? totally. Now you also still have to spearhead things and you have to be a leader and it's hard like, cause you can't always be the good guy, right? It sucks firing people, man. That's, that's yeah. a really hard thing you have to do. Yeah, that's the worst thing but ever. There has to be enough of a, it's like you're balancing these two things. I do care about you. You're part of, my, of our team. We love you. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to perform. Sure. And it's really hard because you have to balance those two things. And if you don't, your business isn't going to run very yeah. well. I got to ask you a question too. I, I I know your time's valuable and we're 530, but I want to end with maybe with charity. I got to have you back sometime, man. And I'm going to down to Vegas. Maybe, maybe I can connect you down there. But sure. I was invited, uh, I think it was two years ago. I think it was a, a charity event that is your event. Is it Babes in Toyland? I think it is. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's Steve, that's Steve Fowler's event. I, I do some of the promotion and I'm the red carpet host for it. Oh, and the MC. oh you're the, okay. So I don't know why I thought it was your event. So uh, talk yeah. to me about charity. How in, in men of action, one of the things that I've always realized when I was building business, some of the greatest connections I've ever made have been in charity and philanthropy. That's not why I did it. I was instinctually yeah. saying yes. Even when I could barely write the checks, I'd be a title sponsor yeah. to this or that. That gave me a front row seat to so many high value humans that I leveraged into valuable relationships. Um, I've turned them into magic over the years. I don't hear this talked about a lot really on the flip side of philanthropy and giving back. There's so many unique rewards for people that choose to live a life of giving and of service. And, and really I love kids. So it's easy. There's so many great causes out there. How important is this it, 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 as far as becoming a high value person to understand? So we have in, in my program, we teach six different event types and I won't go over all six, but oh. one of them is the charity gala. And it was one of these things where mm. I realized from all these female influencers that I knew they had a superpower and their superpower was getting eyeballs to pay attention to whatever they were doing. Ah. And I would ask these ladies, I was like, listen, I understand you're trying to make money on OnlyFans or whatever, trying to get paid to be a model. But could, would you mind using some of your superpower, some of your clout to raise money for animal rescue, sure. to raise money for ALS, to raise money for uh, cancer research? So smart. To raise money for homeless people in you know Los Angeles or uh, Las Vegas, that raise money for domestic abuse and raise money for troops overseas, would you be willing to do that? Well, we, when you do that experiment, you find that it works outrageously so well good. because women want to be a part of it. You know, it's it's part of the charity. It's one of the weirdest things you'll ever see. Is that like you'll pay fifteen hundred bucks to go to the Playboy Mansion and see these girls, and then you'll pay a hundred bucks to go to Babes in Toyland. You'll see the same girls, but like people don't want to go to it because it's a charity event. It's really weird hmm. how that whole mentality works. So um, the other thing is I notice is you know I learned from the best Dan Fleischman and his Model Citizen events, uh, uh, Model Citizen fund events are just loaded with beautiful women, but sure. he doesn't you he uses the beautiful women in order to get them to notice, um, it, to get other people to spend money on the charity. Here's one thing you have to grasp. And I so talked good. to Dan Fleischman and he agrees with me totally on this. Okay. I don't fucking care where the money came from. And I actually don't even care if you just gave us the money for a tax write-off. I don't care where your heart was hmm. when you gave me the money, right. as long as the resources go to the rescued animals. Perfect. 
as long as the resources go to the homeless children. I don't care what your what was in your heart when you gave me the money because it all spends the same. And it's something you have to get over as a human when you do these things like, I don't want to do public charity events because I don't need to let people know that I did. I don't care one way or the other if you give me credit. All I care about is that the people who need the, the domestic abuse shelter got the resources. That yeah. is all I care about. I couldn't take your ego, put it to the side and stop worrying about, well, that guy just donated because he wanted to look cool in front of a girl. I was like, I don't give a shit why he did it. As long as the charity gets the toys, that's all that matters to me. Yeah, it's funny. You're right in this conversation. I'm, and I'm in agreement with it because if you care about the kids, we're doing everything we can. And however we find leverage to make, raise the most money, that's how we're going to do it. There's a lot of charity vets in Corlean. We have a lot of rich people. Have Kardashians just moved. A lot of celebrities up here. Um, there's a, a community a event called Community Cancer Fund. And one thing they did different in North Idaho here in Coeur d'Alene that I thought was genius, they really tapped into some of these really poshy, ritzy neighborhoods out here. It's Gaza Ranch and Black Rock. And they tapped into all this L.A. money, Las Vegas money. The same developers that uh, that did Gaza Ranch just did a, a development out in Vegas, the Summit. It's a, um, a Discovery Land Company. And so these mm -hmm. are some of the nicest developments in the world. And they are, they just are, are a playground for the super wealthy the, uh, celebrities and athletes, like, you know, A-list athletes out here. Right. Mm -hmm. But we had some really genius people out here that said, Hey, all this money's out here. How are we going to tap into that? And they created just like in Lake Tahoe, a celebrity golf tournament. They started really trying to understand, but you get all the North Idaho regulars that are, you know, rich guys from North Idaho that don't understand it. And they would throw all this mud at it. Said, oh, they just throw lavish parties for themselves. I was, yeah. And without even asking, they just raised $3 million like that. Like yeah. who cares if it goes to the kids? It always bothered me when these, some of these old dogs that I'm friends with would talk shit about how they raised the money. And like, and I'm like, no, it's genius because the money's going right to kids with cancer, period. End of story. It's going right to families with cancer and they do it in an effortless way. Has you ever been a charity where you go through a hundred different auction items and you're sitting there bored out of your mind? It's painful. These guys don't even do that and they raise more money. They do it in such genius ways. But again, like you're right. It speaks to this point, right? So I'm glad we brought this up, man, because I think charity's big. And Dan Fleischman, man, that is definitely a man on a mission. He does not care. He's about where it comes from. He cares about the causes that he puts his heart into. So shout out to our boy, Dan. Uh, what a great yeah, I mean, guy he is. If you're one of these individuals like, oh, this kid's 18 years old and he's a Twitch streamer and he made $3 million last month and I don't want his money. Bro, get over yourself. Yeah. I don't care where the money comes from. Sure. I don't give a shit about any of that. I only care that the people who are in need receive the resources and the money. Yeah, that's good, man. Listen, everything we spoke to today will contribute to you being a high value human. Even the psychology, what he's saying, like it or, or, or hate it, does not matter. It's all actually how the world works. This is a really great conversation. We definitely have to do, do a part two because I feel like we barely scratched the service with you, Michael. Um, but thank you for doing this today, man. I, I I wish I could keep talking to you so much. I'll be in Vegas soon, though, brother. I hope to be able to look okay. you up. Okay, anytime so. you want, yeah. Yeah. Colton, what do I do, brother? You want me to do an outro here on this one? That's right. And that's why I was meeting my producer. Okay. So, hey, so one last thing, Michael, I want to make sure we know where we can people send people that are trying to be high value humans that want to get in your world that are interested in what you're doing. You're definitely the, someone that someone should follow. You are a just a value spewing book of resources and information that just pouring out day and night. So where can we send people to find you? The probably the best place is going to be um, Michael Sartain on Instagram is probably the easiest place to find me. Uh, if you DM me the word free, or if you comment the word free, I'm going to send you a link to our free school server. It's uh, school, S K O O L dot com forward slash men of action free. There's a hyphen in between each word, men hyphen of exact, et cetera. Uh, and if you join that free school server, it's going to have our schedule of events. It's going to have a free course called Network High Status Networking 101. Yep. Uh, it's also going to have a list of all, a, a ton of resources as far as interviews is concerned. It's going to have our book list, and it's also going to have tons of testimonials showing other people in Men of Action that have had outrageous success. Oh, so if you guys are interested in that, just message me on, um, on Instagram. The second thing uh, I would tell you is uh, you guys can go to moamentoring.com. And you can just learn about the program, schedule a call and learn how, you know, we've had 850 people go through the program so far in the last almost two years. And so if you guys are interested in learning more about that, uh, just the life changing testimonials that you can see on there, you know, please make sure you check that out. And then lastly, because we're growing so fast, 
if you are a top 1% closer, guys, I'm sorry, like so many, we had, we've, we've only been able, able to hire 1% of the guys who apply. If you're a top 1% closer uh, and you'd like to apply, it's moamentoring.com forward slash jobs. You can ap apply to be a closer or a setter, but like all, we're extremely strenuous in our, um, in our hiring process. If this is your first gig, this is not going to work for you. We're talking, you've done at least a million a quarter. Probably it would probably be the low end for, for us hiring you that in revenue, like uh, in uh, high ticket sales. If you're interested in that, then I would, I would go ahead and apply MOA mentoring.com forward slash jobs. Cool. And you got to be a local in Vegas or can someone be in Miami and apply no, for that? No, no, no. I have guys in London. I have guys in, awesome. in, in, in Europe, like all over Europe. Yeah. Let's you go closers. Be, Bring in the you, closers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, English, you need to be obviously proficient in English. Sure. But other than that, I don't even care if you have an accent. We've got closers in Mexico. It doesn't make any difference. But um, this is a it's a it's a tough closing gig. But if you become a closer for us, then unfortunately, you have to go to Jamaica with us on 150 girls in swimsuit Aww, USA. And you have to come to the bikini competition here in Las <laughs> Vegas. And you have to come to MOA Summit. It sucks, bro. If you become one of our closers, Man, you have to do all that shit. That's cool. Yep. Well, I appreciate you, dog. This has been great. If you ever need anything from me, bro, however I can serve you, my heart's with you, brother. I, I love Love your oh, yeah. Hey, I appreciate that, Eric. Let's definitely do another one. Let me know when you come to Vegas and, and tell Ed, I'd love to have him on my show. I have I a, a ton of really interesting questions for him. Tell him, man. Absolutely. Ed, Ed, okay. be, Ed be a great guest for you. All right. Hey, thank you for joining Man on Mission. This was a really cool episode with Michael Sartain. Please go follow him. This was a lot of fun. The guy's incredibly smart, super interesting. He's got sticky topics. If you enjoyed the show, please like it, share it, send it to people that you think it will help. Please spread the message and we'll see you next time. Thank you.